series. I'm so excited to be here with you all. As we begin to come in and fill up the online room, I would love to get started. So don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. We will be on the ball. I hope that you've had a great year. Congratulations on graduating. It's so exciting to be on holidays now. I am ready spaghetti and I hope that you are too. Let's get going. So as you all know, I just wanted to give a little intro about ATAR Notes, the company that is the reason that we are here today. So since 2007, this company has offered heaps and heaps of free resources to make sure students just like you can, can access and can thrive in your supremely awesome studies. We've offered free lectures since 2015, lectures just like this one today. Special thanks to our unique partners for making these um, lectures possible and making sure that you check out their sessions during these lectures. The free lectures are in line with ATAR Notes mission to help students as much as possible and we have tons and tons of free resources for you. Some of these resources are up on the slide here. These are just some of the things that we offer. We have free notes, free videos, free guides from past students and heaps more. All on our brand new website. We've just recently updated our website and this is where you'll find pretty much everything under the sun that you'll need study-wise. If you're not sure where to start, you can just search the function, just go onto Google and you can type in this website, there'll be a link at the top corner there, and you'll be able to just um, go through the search function and be able to navigate that website really easily. Check out our discussion.atarnotes.com for our brand new Q&A section, which is super epic if you ask me. And if you're looking for even more support, we've got you covered with all these resources here on the slide. We offer low cost group and private tutoring, printed study guides, and online access to study resources with Ed Unlimited. I'll speak more about these later on, but for now, let's get into the lecture. So as you all know, today is a revision lecture for HSC PE and it is one of my favorite subjects. I love all my subjects. So it is really exciting to be here with you all and revise on our wonderful content of PE. I am going to give a little intro slide. This is our agenda for the day to make sure that you can keep me on track too. <laughs> I want to give you a little intro first. So I'm going to go through the who, what, when, where, how, where, all that sort of stuff in terms of today. I'm going to give you some time to put our P brains onto paper. And I really want to get us in the headspace for HSC. And as much as that may be nerve wracking, I promise you are not alone and I'm here with you for this journey. We're going to have a little break. So I want to make sure that you can absorb what is being said already. You can, you know, get some water, go to the bathroom. That will be there too. And then at the end, I want to pass the microphone over to you and I want to be able to answer your questions. I want to see if you can practice what we've revised and go through and really test your own revision capacity. So today's going to be a little bit interesting. I've um, planned it a little bit differently than other PE lectures that I've hosted in the past, but that's okay. It's all going to be good and fun. So as for our intro, and I've already started talking, but I want to make sure that you've got your phones with you. We're going to be using slido.com. So please go onto Google and type in the slido.com. You can either type the code there to join our server, or you can scan the QR code right here on my screen. I would love for you to first answer this one question because I just want to get to know you a bit more. I'm sure that you may know of me, but that's okay. I will introduce myself in a second, the next slide. I'm sure. So I've just asked, what are you excited to go over in this lecture? I want to see and gauge how I can best help you with the time that we have. So as we begin to answer that, I'm going to keep moving along. And this is me. You've probably seen me before many times, but my name is Zafira Stelios. I graduated in 2020. Um, felt like a long time ago, but it's not. <laughs> and I uh, loved all of my subjects supposed to be band six for PDHPE as well, but that's okay. <laughs> we, um, we're going to, we're going to keep going. Um, I'm currently in my second year of law and international studies at UNSW. And I'm really, really excited because I'm really excited for the future with, um, HSC and with the world. And I think that it's really great that you are all here a part of this journey too. We've got some awesome, um, responses coming through in the sense where people have told me a little bit of what they're excited for. Don't worry, we're going to cover as much of them as possible. 
I would love to just let you know, and you probably already picked up on what I've been putting down, this lesson or this lecture, sorry, my apologies with that one. <laughs> this lecture today is going to go over some studying hacks, some tips and tricks. We're going to go over unpacking questions. We're going to really nail down how to approach the HSC and be able to smash it with flying colors. This lecture series is, well, this lecture right now is not going to be a predominant content heavy focused lecture. We're going to go through different practice questions from different content areas of both the cause health priorities and factors affecting performance. I wanna make sure that we can at least grasp that 50% of that HSC. I know that all of the other option options that every student is studying is vastly different. And I unfortunately don't have enough time to go through every single one of them in as much detail. So I would just like to preface that if you have any questions content specific related, please feel free to ask them in the in the questions box on our Slido poll that you've got on your phones. And I will be trying my best to answer as many of them as possible. But just a heads up again, a reminder, this is not going to be a content syllabus dot point by dot point lecture. We're gonna go through some revision and some writing workshops like we had mentioned in our agenda. So let's get started. I am ready and I hope that you're ready too. I had mentioned before that you will need a pen and paper. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to quickly grab those because it's going to be a very um, beneficial lecture to be here today. We know that the HSC is quite near and I wanna give you as much of an advantage as possible alongside me <laughs> while I can be here and help you. So I hope that by now that you've got your pens and your papers, it's so much better to practice uh, preparing for the HSC when you have physically when you have to physically write it in front of you. And I know some of my students know that that's my biggest um, excitement for tutoring. I'm like, yay, I love this idea of active recall. We're really trying to strengthen those neural pathways in our brain. So that in order to be completely strengthened and solidified, we need to write them down onto paper. Okay, so there's gonna be three parts to this writing workshop. I really want to go through, firstly, in our section A, I want to look into how to write an amazing response and how to set yourself up in a good way so that you can establish almost a checklist and get through the response cohesively, succinctly, and just easily. We want to make sure that it is just to flow and it comes naturally to you. I want to break down some of the verbs that Nessa directs us as HSC students to be able to answer so that we can ensure we understand the verb and then apply all of the specific verb related connections into our response so that that way it shows us that we've actually answered the entire question. Now that might sound way more confusing than what it is, but I promise you already know way more than you think you do in relation to the verbs and I cannot wait to share in this light of your intelligence. It's going to be wonderful. Then I want to go through some examples. So you can see here that in underneath that examples box, I've written P without examples like a burger without buns. And if you know me, you know that I love, first of all, food and burgers. And second of all, my burger analogy, my burger writing analogy, we're going to go through a little bit later on, but it's really important that in order to really just hit your hit your responses head on its ham with a hammer you need to include an example so that that way it's really just a valid strong super powerful awesome amazing response exactly like you awesome super powerful incredible all of these things so there's going to be a little bit of a um like a, a flow chart that we're going to flow through. So there's building blocks that we will work on today and work through. And I make a big point of the we because I'm here together with you. So don't feel as though um, it's just you. This lecture is going to be recorded. So you will be able to have access to it and rewatch it as many times as you'd like. So that that way you can grasp and completely absorb and, um, you know, make what I'm saying tangible in your own life too. You will also have access to these slides, so please don't worry about that as well. So we know that when we are writing a response in PE, and, and this is very um, important, before we get into our actual revision practice and our writing workshop, it's important to know what to write. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, duh, Zafira, I know how to write. I literally just graduated high school. Come on, we've done my trials. I've finished like 
50% of my um, HSC so far. I really just know how to write, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I get you. I, I agree, me too. <laughs> but it's important that we can fine tune our writing so that that way we can maximize the last 50% of this HSC that's coming up now, right? So intros are a great way to set up your response. Now, there are times and places where intro sentences or introductory sentences are necessary, but there are also times when you don't need them and you can tell when you don't need them. So, so don't worry, we're going to go through all of those points and you'll be uh, on point with that too. It's also really great because it shows the marker that you know exactly where the syllabus is is being asked of and what you would need to include in your response. The directive verb is understood because you're like, hey, I can unpack exactly how these two connect or how this can be explained or how this can be compared. You're going to be talking a lot of, um, it's almost like, you know, opening the doors to your response and it's just well lit this room and, and it's a very great celebration. Your confidence is high because you know that if you were to read back, it would A, make sense, B, be awesome, and C, it would really answer the question and hit that nail on the head. Um, so let's go through some examples to really see exactly what I'm saying. And if I'm going too fast, you just let me know. <laughs> okay, so... We are going to go through a five marker question here for a, a, a dot point within factors affecting performance. I paused there because I have a question coming up in relation to the syllabus and I didn't want to tell you that answer before I gave you the question. So um, that was me stopping myself there. This question here asks us to assess the characteristics of a skilled performer. Now, I want you to think about where in the syllabus exactly which focus question, what dot point, think about uh, the syllabus and I want you to scan the QR code here because I would love to ask you where exactly in the syllabus is this question referring to. So this is going to be a little bit fun um, throughout our lecture today. I've got a couple of our Slido polls ready and buzzing. So I am excited to see all of your engagement with that too. I'll wait a little bit as those responses begin to flow through and, you know, all the students become so much more closer to me <laughs> in our online space and we can all be together. So this focus question is derivative from the last point of our factors affecting performance syllabus. We are going through... Um, I'm, I'm, we can see that that is where it was you I hopefully you got that response to now for an introductory sentence for this question here it's a five marker that's a big point to look out for I would I would say something like a skilled performer often demonstrates characteristics such as kinesthetic sense anticipation consistency and technique I use the acronym cat you might use a different acronym but it is acronyms as a top tip are a fantastic way to um, go over your content through the syllabus through PE and really just solidify your knowledge and ensure that hey you tick all your boxes because you know all of those acronyms and and the words underneath that mnemonic so um, hopefully you can begin to see the purpose of this sentence here and you can understand yeah actually it does almost establish my response gives me the room and the framework so that I can continue writing whilst answering the question in the first sentence of these are the four um, characteristics of a skilled performer and my response will further dive into them and I'll have an example. It's almost what you're telling the marker. So let's go through another response. What are the responsibilities of each of the three levels of government for the delivery of health services in Australia? Now you would have noticed, and hopefully you would have picked up, that I am now onto our health priorities um, focus question, uh, call, sorry. And it is good because the constant bouncing between factors and health priorities is really gonna test how much you know. And I just wanted to add a little bit of spice and test how much you know today. Um, it is going to be about how much you have revised and We'll go through it together. Don't feel pressured or anything like that or overwhelmed. It's going to be a lot more easier than you think. So if we were to begin thinking about 
how to set up our response in your minds. I want you to start thinking about, you know, like what would I write? How would I begin to be, to begin answering this question? You know, it's important that we can pick up that it's four marks that the question asks us responsibilities of each of the three levels of government. So we know that that is a focus question of um, that. We know that that's the third focus question within our health priorities syllabus. And it asks us, that, that that area of our syllabus looks at, you know, the expenditure, the um, care and prevention, looking at our um, delivery of health services, the responsibility of them. We're looking through an unpacking of the administrative, administrative side to our health in all of Australia. So I want to show you an introduction that I've written for this sentence, the three levels of government in Australia are the local, state, and federal. And that is enough for you to set up your response and just begin working through it. Now, I wanna ask you another question on Slido. So scan the QR code here up on the screen. I want to tell, I want you to tell me how and why this introduction is effective. I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that because I wanna grasp the trains of thought that are rolling through your brain at the moment now. We've got some answers coming through. Some students are saying that it is just easy to read. Um, we've got some students saying that it is um, short, sharp, straight to the point. Exactly. And I hope that you are able to see the purpose of this introductory sentence. And I don't want to feel, uh, I don't want you to feel confused or um, unsure, overwhelmed because you have an extra responsibility of an introductory sentence. That's not the case. This is essentially breaking down your response into doable, practical sentences that we can really establish and make them purposeful. This is important because we can guarantee that we will receive marks in every sentence or marks on every line. Delve into what wasn't explicit, addresses and identifies components of the question, um, like a subheading. Yes, it states an opening, identifies that you'll be talking about. Um, it's short knowledge. It's short because it's a four marker. Oh my goodness, this is fantastic. I'm so excited to be in the presence of all you intelligent brainiacs with PE. It's fantastic. Introduces the key points, shows you know the syllabus. Bam, bam, bam. That is awesome. And that's exactly what the point of this part of our lecture is and you've identified that you are going to smash the HSC and I mean that from the bottom of my heart because if you can understand the question and begin to attack it and understand the purpose of what you're writing and why it is impactful <laughs> like the markers are going to love it it's going to be fantastic let's keep going along I really like this train of um, our trajectory through this lecture. Thank you so much for your responses. Please keep them coming. I definitely want to hear how your brains are working and unpacking what I am saying. Let's go through another another example. I am going to go through a lot of examples. Hopefully you will have it drilled into your head by the end of our time together. So the first point I want to direct you to is how many marks this question is worth. We can all see that it is worth eight marks. So we know that these are a bit more of a meteor response required for PE. It's not just a short, sharp three, four marker. We have a little bit more depth to divulge into. So this question asks us, explain why individuals, communities and governments should work in partnership on health promotion initiatives. Provide examples. Now, this question is once again from our health priorities uh syllabus and it is asking us about why individuals communities and governments should work together in partnership in health promotion so this is a specific question in relation to focus question four of our pe health factors syllabus uh, sorry health factors health priority syllabus and this is where we look at the Ottawa Charter, where we look at our health promotion initiatives. Some students looked at national tobacco strategy. Others look at the mental health strategies. There are um, the road traffic and speeding strategies. There's the close the gap program and initiative. All of those things we look at in this section here. We also look at our Ottawa Charter and our social justice principles and how they can intertwine and overlap. 
So obviously you can see where this question comes from and notice how easy and how fast it was for me to be able to recall the syllabus. That is the goal ultimately for you as well. We want to make sure that you can really just see the syllabus in your head if you close your eyes and you'll be able to pinpoint, yep, that's exactly where it is in my brain and I know the syllabus like I know the way that my hair is brown and you will be so much more confident with yourself in that response. Okay, I will um, begin to show you this introduction here that I would write. Individuals, communities and governments should work in partnership on health promotion initiatives like the Slip Slop Slap program. So I've already mentioned here almost like a judgment sentence that they should work together because here in the question it asks me why they should. <laughs> so I'm essentially saying oh, they need to and I will go into why they need to further in my response. So I hope that you can begin to see that. Now I, I want to grab your phone out again and scan this QR code because I have another question for you. My question asks, imagine you are completing the rest of this sentence. Think about why these levels of government should work together. What are the benefits of them working together? I want to see how much you can remember and uh, know that your answers aren't wrong or right or anything like that. I just want to see where your brain is at so we can begin to unify our awesome PE knowledge and um, be on the same wavelength, which is going to be epic. So as the, as the answers start rolling through, we've got, um, you know, a pooling together of resources and being able to be more effective. Fantastic. I am a massive advocate for resource efficiency. We want to make sure that things work as well as they say they do. And if we can collaboratively work together, well, it's going to take off the job and the stress load for, you know, many other factors and sectors within our healthcare in its entirety. So that's a really great response. We've got things like helps it more helps it to be more effective. They work together. It's a fixation on the people. Yes, that is awesome. I'm really, really loving this. Um, they target different people, so they should all work together because they have different reaches um, and different different capacities. We know that um, individuals can only um, become role models for themselves and, and become educated and really understand what health is and how to be more protective in their behaviors with their lifestyle and all these types of things and communities can collaboratively work together to create safe spaces to have, um, you know, um, meetings and, and, and groups and, and, and fun runs and all these things that we can do together to work on our health as a whole. And governments have the power to provide these health these health facilities and, and fund them and make sure that we have access to them regularly and, and that they're clean and that we can, um, you know, use them for free if need be and, and have them for lifelong purposes. So this is fantastic. We've even got some more students here. Each um, funding can be accurately distributed. Yay, this is awesome. I'm so proud of everyone. This is great. Um, it ensures that equality is, is created, um, that there is... Um, you know, power in individuals and communities working together and then governments and communities and then governments and individuals and how they all interconnect. Yes. And um, they can align their aims and have an effective health initiative. Fantastic. I am very, very excited and very, very pleased to know that you are all awesome. And this is fantastic. Your studying has definitely paid off. Um, we can see benefits, creating supportive environments, greater access. Yes, we've got um, the fact that they can work together to move more effective forms of resource allocation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I have some students that have written examples and have really completed this response with a lot of depth. And I'm very, very excited to read them later on and, you know, just, just be a little bit lit up with all of your PE knowledge. That's fantastic. Let's keep going to the next question. So, sorry, to the next slide. I hope that you can see that in some situations... Introductory sentences are not always necessary. It's not like the be all end all for your responses and for your PE, HSC. Not at all. Sometimes for really lower weighted questions or ones with verbs like outline, you, you really don't have the space, the time, the, 
the the lines <laughs> to really write an introductory sentence. You can you can still use aspects of the introductory sentence, but make it meaningful and short, sharp, straight to the point. So, for example, if we have a three marker on um, you know energy systems, you don't need to tell me energy systems are the three energy systems within the body or whatever it is like that. The three energy systems um, you might you might be able to really shorten that um, initial sentence starter of your question. And you might be able to say something like um, ATP and um, ATP PC and the aerobic energy system are different energy systems. You're answering the question, let's say the question was compare two energy systems, you would compare anaerobic and aerobic, right? There's no need to compare um, to aerobic or, sorry, to anaerobic. So you, you, begin to see that sometimes introductory sentences, while they're fantastic, they can be shortened. They're always um, there implicitly, but they can be modified to fit the question and the marks. Sometimes for higher order questions, it is effective. Like our past examples, we could see they're great in establishing your response. They're great at almost setting out what you're going to talk about in in your answer so that the marker knows okay this is what I'm looking for it's like an umbrella that really just um you know over like um encapsulates that response and it, and it allows for the response to flow and to be immerseful how will you know if the intros are necessary or if you know your intro is too long or too short or anything like that which are questions that you're probably thinking and are probably valid not probably, and are always valid. They're, it's very, very um, real to be worried and to make sure that you're doing the best that you possibly can. This just comes with practice. Luckily for you, we're in a revision lecture. So the things that we are working on today is going to really help nail down and that practice to allow you to feel confident in your decision of, okay, yes, I need a strong introductory sentence or mm, I can make it a little bit enmeshed with the question and just really just answer it straight from the get-go um, or I can begin to um, plan out my response and I can see do I need one do I not it's going to be something that we work on together I am really really loving all of your responses they're still coming and flooding through which is fantastic I am so so relieved to know that I have an awesome group with me today <laughs> um, I want to get going on our first practice question to begin to put our PE brain onto paper. We've gone through a little bit of an introduction, right? So I want to ask you, do you think this question needs an introductory sentence? If so, please write one. This is going to be a great indication to see if you can identify yourself um, if this is relevant to have an introductory sentence or if not. And if it would be relevant, what would you write? And I would just love to hear your brains. Um, feel free to pop it in the Q&A as like a little comment or you can um, keep going and, you know, just make a note in your head. But I want to just let you know, do you think that this question needs an introductory sentence? This question reads, outline three physiological adaptations in response to aerobic training. And we know automatically that this is a first, this is the like second component of our first focus question of factors affecting performance, where we look at our um, uh, training methods and we look at our training types and we have our principles to training and we've got our um, different We've got strength training, we've got flexibility, we've got uh, aerobic, we've got anaerobic, all of those things and how they have their different layers to it. For strength training, we've got our fixed and free weights and for um, flexibility, we've got PNF and dynamic and we've got static and we've got ballistic and, you know, for all of those things and, and the little nitty gritty parts there. Do we need an example introductory sentence here? I'll let you go with that one. Next question, we're going to really just solidify our knowledge and ham home this idea of introductory sentences. This question asks us to describe the different recovery strategies used by athletes to improve their performance. Now, this question is eight marks and this question is come, this question also comes from the factors affecting performance syllabus and it is in relation to focus question three and we look at things like our 
um, cryotherapy, we've got our physiological, we've got our psychological, we've got all of these different components of our recovery strategies that can be holistically used for an athlete to essentially get in the proper headspace, rest their body so that they can perform well again for the next competition, next event, next sporting day. And we can keep going with our um, our strength and then our fitness and be able to maintain our level of performance. And, you know, like building blocks, we're going to keep going and going and going. So do you think this question needs a introduction? Um, what would you write? What would your introductory sentence be? Would it be quite long, quite short? Would it be wordy? Would you list every single possible thing that the recovery strategies do? Or would you just essentially, you know, mention them? I hope that you can begin to see that this is um, important to know and to do and to be able to identify. And I hope that with our introductory practices, uh, as a whole and individually with yourself now you can you can really begin to put those puzzle pieces together and it's starting to light up in your brain hopefully that if you think this question needs an introductory sentence you would have finished it by now let's go on to our next question describe two action areas of the ottawa charter so this we know is a direct focus question for question of our health priorities in Australia and it is really important. I have a little acronym for Ottawa Charter and I know that we said that this is not going to be revision content based but I love this acronym and it's for we know that there are five action areas of the Ottawa Charter. So this acronym that I've created a little bit not creative but anyway <laughs> it's Dipsy Sub and it's like Oh, well, I'm going to go through all the areas. Developing personal skills. We're going through creating supportive environments, strengthening community action, reorienting health services, and developing public healthy public policy. Dipsy Saab. Because if you put all of the action areas together in a word, it makes Dipsy Saab. And it's a really long acronym, but it's pronounced like dips, like chips and dips. <laughs> Dipsy Saab. So maybe if you can remember that, that'll be good. If you forget, you know, three... Or, or one of that action area of the Ottawa Charter, at least you'll know you've got all five. Dipsy Saab. So if you think this question needs an introductory sentence, what would it be? What would you write? It's four marks, so maybe we can have one. Maybe we can make it a little bit short. You know, I would love to, um, if you're comfortable, feel free to write them down in, you know, the Q&A section just as like a statement and I can read them and um, give you feedback and things like that, but I, I, I'm pretty sure and pretty confident that you've picked up what I'm putting down. <laughs> Let's go to our next question. To what extent is access to healthcare facilities and services equitable for all Australians? Now, this question once again comes from our health priorities syllabus, and we are looking now at our focus question three of health priorities on the right hand side of the syllabus. It asks us how actual how actually equitable and accessible is our healthcare system? Because in this section of our focus question, we're looking through our um our new treatments and 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 early diagnostic tools and stuff like that that can be quite expensive for some people in Australia or for some groups in Australia. So does that mean it's actually fair and equal? If if, if it doesn't actually reach people that it was supposed to help, how, how do they access that? Or we know that there are, for example, um, a lot less services and facilities in rural areas and regional areas of Australia and the lack of access to those adequate healthcare facilities can be quite detrimental, life-threatening sometimes. We know that, for example, um, if um, ambulance responses and stuff like that have a longer period of time, not only to travel, but of, of time to take because maybe um, it is quite far away, maybe the roads aren't great quality and then they aren't able to access these people and that need help, or yes, we've got our Royal Flying Doctor Service and we've got all these things, but how actually equitable, e equitable is it? So this question is eight marks and we've got a verb here that's pretty powerful that we're going to go into in a second. To what extent? Now this means that we would need to make a judgment. We would need to say, yeah, it does, but it also doesn't. 
to what extent questions ask you how much. So it's saying how much is um, Australia's healthcare and facilities and whatever equitable for all Australians. And our response needs to be this much. So it goes on to by saying, um, you know, our, our healthcare and our facilities and our services are inequitable, are significantly lacking in access, or they're fantastic and, you know, everyone has access to them. And it's a, it's a, it's a well-distributed, um, disseminated facility service that Australia offers that makes it a crux, it makes it, you know, really like distinguished in all of the healthcare systems in Australia or in, in the world. What is your judgment? Do you think that this question needs a practice uh, needs an introductory statement? If so, what would it be? I hope that you could pick up that pattern of what um, of these practice questions. I know that we had four, two from each call, but there were some questions where mm, you might not necessarily need an introductory sentence, but there are some that you do. I hope that you can begin to see this is how you practice that how will you know section of our introductory slide that we looked at prior. So I hope that you can understand what is going through my head now and going through the slides as we see them together. Let's keep going through because we are zooming in our lecture and I'm very excited to keep going. So I mentioned that introduction sentences need to address the question. Now, in order to address the question, we have to look at our directive verb. And there are millions of verbs that Nessa likes to sprinkle in our questions to, you know, spice up the HSE. And there are some verbs that can be quite confusing or some verbs that, you know, really just we see and we, we, we familiar with, but we don't actually know how to, you know, um, nail that question and really just tick that verb. You probably may receive or may have known people that received, you know, like, question marks in their responses in their exams or things like that or it's like it doesn't really relate to the question or you know um it's a bit of waffling here you're going on a bit of a tangent our directive verbs so our outline our to what extent our describe our explain examine assess um justify compare all of the adjectives that Nessa uses really are just there to redirect our brains and guide us in the right direction almost like a steering point so they help us answer the question and show off our knowledge of the content. But we have to do that through those directive verbs. So how we understand that direction will determine our answer and then our mark. Now that may seem a bit pressuring and a bit like, whoa, it's a lot for one verb, but that's okay. We're going to go through it and it'll make a lot more sense in a second. Uh, I have a, a really easy to follow um breakdown of these verbs and it, it's it makes it make sense this really helped me when I was in your position so I want to do exactly the same for you so when you approach a question and you notice the directive verb I'm going to take you through like my three-step process of how to approach a question and what I look for I've started to drop those seedlings here and there as we go but I I will make that more clear coming up so our directive verbs tell us exactly what we need to do to answer the question if, for example, it is an explained question, we need to show the marker that there's a relationship between the com concepts in the question, that there's, an imp there's a cause and an effect. We need to show that one directly impacts the other and we need to show how they are intertwined. They're easy to identify. We know what the verbs look like. So we can, we can really pinpoint and show the marker, hey, <laughs> you can't trick me today. I've got this. I know my directive verbs. I went to the PE lecture in September <laughs> and our buzzwords come naturally. The buzzwords are things that connect the directive verb and the response together. So like I mentioned for the explain example, our buzzwords are your cause and your effect. So all those relational connective words come really easily and naturally. The more that you see these directive verbs and pinpoint exactly what they're asking of you. Let's break these down. Nessa, you just can't trick us like seriously you can try but you know we're just far ahead of you <laughs> when it comes to verbs like outline this is something that we saw in our prior introductory practice questions where there was an outline question and maybe you might feel mm, I don't actually need an introductory sentence for an outline question fantastic outline essentially means sketch in general terms so for your response that would be list and identify not in dot points, 
in sentences, in prose, but it would be really great so that you can show the marker this is exactly what it is. Describe. Describe asks you to show the characteristics and features of. Essentially, you need to paint a picture to the marker. You need to, you need to, you know, um, in English, how we say show not, uh, show not tell, same sort of vibe. You don't need to go into a lot more imagery and, and anything like that where you are meshing English and PE together. That's not what I'm trying to say, and I hope I haven't confused you. But essentially, describe means that you you're creating a, a you're setting a scene you're you're establishing the response and you're connecting it to the content so we saw in our prior um, practice questions for the introductory section just before we had things like describe the two feature uh, sorry two action areas of Ottawa charter so that would mean let's say for example I'm going to go through reorienting health services as one of my action areas and developing public health policy. So reorienting health services means for me to describe it, I need to, sh well, not I need to, but the healthcare is shifted from a curative approach to a preventative approach. So that means, well, the healthcare in Australia is not just a reaction right? It's not designed to only cure what has happened and the problems that occur later on in people's lives, for example. It is more so focused on how can we prevent, how can we implement education strategies, how can we showcase people to, you know, be influenced and be um, positively role modeled to have positive health behaviors in their life and to manage their stress and to be able to cope with, um, you know, life and what happens and and have those foundations set up in place of nutrition and of movement and of um, social connections to be able to deal with our stress and things like that so that it's not so um, impactful later on in our lives how can we prevent that so that's what I would talk about when I would uh, describe that action area and I would I would give an example and I would say something like um, you know reorienting health services with with the focus of shifting Healthcare to be curative and making it preventative allows Australians to, you know, um, learn about these positive health behaviors and, and really creates ripple effects, right? For example, we can have our, you know, um, slip, slop, slap program and how we have sunscreens in all of the parks, um, soccer parks and, and things like that. And that is great because it is free and accessible and while we sunscreen is readily available for people we can use them and they can prevent later onset skin cancer in the future or anything like that and then for pub developing public health policy you would go and say something similar i hope that that makes sense for describe for explain i really love explain i don't know i think once you learn it and you really like can grasp exactly how to approach it you're like yep bam bam thank you ma'am that is amazing explain is great so explain, like I said before, shows a cause and effect. I like to picture it as like tug of war. We can see that there's like a an imbalance sometimes or that sometimes things can work together. Sometimes there's one component of the question that is really dependent on the other or anything like that. This just makes it easier for you and for the marker to be able to establish a relationship and show how that they are intertwined. So if an explain question arises, let's say, for example, um, I don't know, explain the purpose of, um, oh, explain how um, anxiety can be managed and motivation can be enhanced in, in performance. So that we know is a direct question of focus question two of our factors affecting performance syllabus. And we're looking at, you know, anxiety and arousal and motivation and things like that. And there's the inverted U hypothesis there that goes with that syllabus. There's also the um, the strategies there to enhance your motivation and, and relax your anxiety and things like that. So if we have to explain the purposes of those and how they intertwine together, well, you would say something like um, the... Uh, Managing anxiety and enhancing motivation are mutually intertwined. That can be your introductory sentence. And then you can start off by saying, um, 
in order to manage an athlete's anxiety, they need to make sure that they are um, breathing properly and they can be concentrating and focused and they can um, do all of these mental rehearsal strategies and tactics that can manage their anxiety state or trait so as to better enhance their motivation and performance for the game at play. It goes to show me as a marker that in this tug of war of anxiety and, and motivation, we can have less anxiety, more motivation. That's sort of how that would work. So we need to show that relationship and be quite clear in that regard. Now, here we've got to what extent. Now, to what extent is exactly like what I mentioned before. To what extent is the healthcare in Australia equitable? or access to healthcare equitable. To what extent asks you to make a judgment? To what extent means you have to tell me positives, negatives, how good, how bad. You need to you need to be able to show me both points. Now, um, if any students do legal studies, you will know what this question approaches and, and how to approach it. Same sort of con, um, wavelength and thought process when it comes to PE. Obviously, we're not comparing legal content, but it's going to be important to show you um, this to what extent point, like I said before, asks you how much. So how much is this effective? How much is access to healthcare in Australia equitable? And then in your response, you will need to say, well, it's this much. Or, um, and it could be better, it could be this much, but there are, you know, barriers in place. And you go through that. To what extent are definitely higher order, higher marking questions. So you probably will get the to what extent for your back end of the short answers or, you know, your option questions or things like that, where you're asking maybe of eight marks, of um, six marks or whatever it might be. There, there are a lot, there's a lot more meat to them with the to what extent because it is requiring you to make a judgment. You have a lot more um space and you need that space to really dive into why it is this much or why it is that much so i hope that that is clear there are some more verbs that we see in pe and they do come up a little bit here and there the first four that were mentioned are a, a lot more prominent in my opinion gauging from all the past papers that i've seen and and the trial papers and stuff like that they are a lot more in your face, obvious, you'll be like, oh, hey, I recognize you. Yep, 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 that three explains or, you know, things like that. You might even get um, maybe similar verbs in multiple choice and you'll be able to recognize, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So let's go and explain these verbs too so we can break them down further. Evaluate is essentially showing me both sides. You're coming up with a middle, like you're going to have a final decision point. Evaluate is very similar to, you know, um, to what extent, where you're asked to make a judgment. You're not asked how much in that same sense, but you are asked to show the positives, the negatives, mm, the in-between, and come up with a general overview of that question. So your question might be evaluate the purpose of um uh, returning, sorry, that's sportsmen, uh, evaluate the purposes of a, um, a kinesthetic, sorry, evaluate the impact that the skilled, the characteristics of a skilled performer have on an athlete. So you would need to say, okay, well, there's, uh, anticipation, consist consistency, kinesthetic sense and technique. I use my cat, um, acronym there and I might be able to say well they are all very very powerful in in ensuring that an athlete can be deemed you know highly skilled but it does take a lot of practice to get to that point and you know there's a lot of time discipline and um, consistency in a pun intended way that needs to occur to make sure that that um, happens you might you might get a you know evaluate how the Three stages of skill acquisition can impact a player's um, skilled characteristics. That's probably a better example of a question. So that would be, you would have to look at the three skill acquisition components. So we've got our cognitive, autonomous, and associative. associative. I've switched the order there, but that's okay. We know where they are in the syllabus. Then you'd go on to say, well, actually, um, you know, being a cognitive 
a learner and in that stage can be quite difficult to get to a skilled character as uh, to get to a skilled learner because you don't have that kinesthetic sense yet your technique is still iffy you're still trying to fine tune all of the movements and and the efficiency of your movements and stuff like that so we would need to show a bit of a middle ground and say yeah while it's great for um, autonomous athletes to be deemed skilled athletes there's a bit of a process behind the scenes let's go to assess Assess is very similar, once again, to to what extent and evaluate. You're making a judgment. You're weighing up the pros and the cons. You're showing me essentially like what is the big picture and how uh, what are the little cracks in there. Assess the effectiveness of recovery strategies for athletes. Um, assess the effectiveness of um, the SPPC criteria for um you know, establishing healthcare initiatives, S triple P C criteria is things like your social justice principles in our health priorities. And we're looking at our priority prevention, sorry, priority population groups, um, potential for prevention and early intervention. We're looking at our um, uh, incidence and prevalence of the actual illness itself and how it's impacting people and the costs, indirect or direct, et cetera, et cetera. So assess essentially means weighing up the pros and cons and showing me, yeah, this is pretty good, but hey, this needs a bit of work. Let's move on to justify. Prove it, essentially. The question is asking, the question is basically justify is saying, this is what it is. Show me that you know this is what it is. You need to show how and why. So if we get to justify the purpose of flexibility training or justify the importance of flexibility training, the, the question is essentially saying flexibility is flexibility training is important. Prove it. And you would need to go on and say flexibility training is essential because it ensures, you know, adequate range of motion, that there that is healthy. It ensures that there's mobility. It's reducing the um, potential for injuries. It's doing all of these things. And that is why we have flexibility training, why it is so important. So you're, you're really being asked to prove it. And compare, we see often, um, compare, you have to show the similarities and differences. So you have to look at it from, you know, um, flip perspectives. Yep, this is great because um, this energy system, this anaerobic ATP PC energy system is fantastic because there's a quick short burst of energy. It's highly efficient in creating creatine phosphate as its uh, fuel source. Um, it does not last very long in its duration. It is quite a short-lived um, energy system in comparison to our aerobic energy system, which does last for a very long time and can take up to 24 hours to 48 hours of recovery to you know replenish energy stores. It does also use... Um, it does not use, the aerobic energy system does not use creatine phosphate as its fuel source. Rather, it uses carbohydrates and fats as its fuel source. So you can show the differences and the similarities. You're really just making those observations between the two. They usually ask a compare question where you can compare the content for. So, for example, compare, you know, the... Um, uh, the recovery strategies and their differences, right? So we can see that we can actually make some comparisons. For example, you know, like cryotherapy is very different to psych, um, like the recovery strategy, the physiological one about cooling down and drinking water. Yes, there's a connection to water with cryotherapy, but that has to do with ice and it's different. Um, you know, so things like that you can compare. I hope that, that is clear as well. Let's go on to our examples. This is really important and it acts as a very um, illuminating point in our responses, in our lectures and uh, sorry, in our HSC. And it really shows the marker that, yep, we are bang on with the question. We know the verb, we've got our introductory sentence and we've got our jazz of our example to really just hone it in and say, yep, we know that what we're saying is true because look at my example, it backs it up. So examples are great. They need to be specific. It's not so much beneficial to have an example that is um, like a football player. Like a football player, what? What You know, things like that. And, and it really showcases to the marker that you know your content bang on um, and it's easy, easy, easy to integrate because you just 
whack it on to your sentence. It adds like wow factors to your response. So it, it gives you room for marks to be gained and it makes the response complete. We want a whole wonderful, powerful response. So let's dive into this further. I'm just having some technical difficulties with my Slido on my end, but that's okay. We will move along and be awesome and show up regardless. So for example, pun intended, I have a question here that asks you, explain what progressive overload is and why it is used. Now, this question is fantastic. I happen to love progressive overload. I go to the gym and I use it in my daily life and I definitely see it having a, a big impact in my performance. That's a pun as well. Um, it's the factors affecting performance here. We're looking at our uh, principles of training. I use the acronym RSVP to weddings. So we've got things like reversibility, specificity, variety, progressive overload, training thresholds and warm up and cool down. So that is something that helps me if that helps you. Feel free to take that too. So I want to ask you, um, you know, we, we would have, you know, like an introductory sentence and a potential example that we could add on here. But I want to ask you, what is an example that you could use? So I have popped the Slido poll up and there'll be a QR code here. Please feel free to scan the code and I would love to write down your example. My example would be, Progressive overload is the act of increasing workload over successive training sessions or continual training sessions. For example, adding one kilo to a squat every time an athlete goes to a gym. Notice how that example is specific in the sense that my progressive overload is strength focused. We know that there's resistance and aerobic on the right hand side of that syllabus, how we have to look at our um, principles to training and why they can, and sorry, not why, how they can be applied to our different types of um, sport, whether it be cardio or strength. That's how I sort of see it. So yeah, what would your example be? Example could be, um, my brother plays soccer and he, so his example might be, um, you know, being able to, I don't know, run, um, one kilometer more each week at training, something like that to be able to build his aerobic performance and capacity when he's playing on his games. What would your example be? As they begin to filter, we've got some really great ones here, some really awesome specific examples about, you know, um, training for longer sets and even, you know, um, swimming in colder waters and uh, doing things like, um, five kilo increases every week, increasing your range of motion. We can be more specific with that one and say how we, we develop our range of motion, but that can maybe relate to flexibility. So if you're saying, um, you want like by using, um, some sort of resistance for PNF, like if the wall or if another person and being able to move through those ranges of motion a lot easier and smoother. So like being able to hold it for longer, um, being able to use like a barbell and go over and up and down over your shoulders and have your shoulders go through their full range of motion, um, increasing the intensity, increasing the run distance, increasing my time. Yes, yes, yes. Increasing your speed on the treadmill. Um, you know, one speed increase per tr session that you train, you can have an incline increase so that can make it harder for you and, and doing things like that to make it a little bit more difficult so that your body can adapt to the changes and to the, um, the training that is occurring so as to be stronger and to have all of these impacts. And the purpose of why it is used is essentially what I said there, to increase your workload, to be able to um, adapt to help your body, um, you know, go through those physiological adaptations to help your muscles begin to um, grow or have hypertrophy. You want to make sure that your training thresholds are being met. All of those types of things are really important when it comes to progressive overload. Let's go to the next example. 
This question asks us to assess the appropriateness of supplementation for athletes. Now, supplementation comes under our nutrition component of our factors affecting performance syllabus. This is focus question three. We look at here the we look at also the importance of, you know, pre during and post event nutrition. So like carb loading, we've got things like um, the fluid intake and stuff like that. We've got our supplements. We have four supplements. I want to see if you can try and remember them off the top of your head. They are protein, creatine, caffeine, and vitamins and minerals. So it's important that we look at both sides here if we have an assessed question, the appropriateness of supplementation for athletes. So is it effective? Is it not effective? Why? What's the reasoning? How can we um, really show that to the marker? Well, you can go through a process of, well, supplementation, maybe your introductory sentence might be, um, you know, supplementation has been quite controversial for athletes as um, it can be, as it does aid with, you know, deficiencies within the body and does help that. But it is also believed that, you know, all of these benefits can come through with a change of diet. So things like that can be an introductory sentence. Then you go in to say, well, you know, um, caffeine is fantastic because it enhances concentration and, you know, gives you a little bit more of arousal to set yourself up for the game. But if you have too much caffeine, sometimes you will have, you know, racing heart, you'll be jittery and you won't be able to sleep properly. And you also, for certain sports, won't be as effective. For example, if you're throwing darts and you've just had a shot of coffee, you're not going to be able to accurately throw that and to have that precision and 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 be, um, yeah, like technical with your fine motor skills of dart throwing, for example. But if you're doing, you know, if you're going to the gym and it's a big leg day and you're going to take some caffeine beforehand, it's going to really hype your body up to get you going and being able to lift those heavy weights. So you have to make sure that you can weigh up the pros and cons, right? Let's go through and look at my, I want to ask you, sorry, what would you write for this question? How would you answer it? Um, I have just popped that question up and I know these questions are very you wordy focused and like writing and things like that, but it is really important to see how we can continue and prove that, you know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> As these answers begin to come through, I am seeing a lot of amazing responses. There's some students that have gotten some dot points as to say like a plan, for what they might say. Fantastic. I don't expect you to write the whole eight marker or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, we have some great students here talking about vitamins and minerals and how that can be um, both effective and ineffective. There are examples here where some students have said, you know, it might be like a pharmaceutical money grab. Is it like actually necessary to be able to take iron tablets if you just should consume more iron dense food like red meat, like salmon, like all these things. But then you would also argue that um, there are um, often people, um, it's predominantly women that have lower iron levels and really require, you know, extra support because their body is lacking the capacity to, to build their iron support and levels up. Um, iron, female athletes, calcium, bones, yes. Creatine supplementation provides 100 meter sprinters with fast ATP regeneration. You are bang on the money. List the pros and cons of each supplementation and how it affects the athlete and their performance. Exactly right. You are all approaching this question really, really well. And I'm so, so excited to see your HSC results and to celebrate all that with you because you really grasp what is um, being spoken about today. You're all sponges and absorbing what I'm saying, which is fantastic. We've got a student who's written, um, it can aid athletes, but it can be detrimental. Great judgment point to, you know, set up your response. Iron tablets are appropriate for women who are iron deficient due to their menstrual cycles. Fantastic because you're explaining me, you're explaining to me the whole picture. You're showing the pros and the cons and you're weighing up. Well, in certain circumstances, that might not be um, appropriate to, you know, just eat more red meat or whatever it might be for iron tablet, for iron deficiencies. Um, fantastic. I'm really, really obsessed with all of your responses. No one's written a protein response yet, but that's okay. We can um, <laughs> keep going. 
uh, carb loading for endurance athletes is good. Um, you know, like supplementation can be used to improve their performance. However, eating a balanced diet should ensure no need for supplementation. Exactly right. So you're really just showing me a middle ground of, yes, supplements can be good, but they can also be bad. And then let's just meet in the middle here. Um, if I was writing this question, I would have a protein response to, and I would, I would use that as an example. So I might say, um, oh, protein is fantastic for enhancing the size and the strength of a muscle. It really develops its fascia and all of the, you know, the muscle tissue and things like that. It is good in terms of helping aid recovery and reducing the, um, I guess, pain of delayed onset muscle soreness or like, you know, DOMS, there's a million different things that it does help. But if you consume too much protein, whether it be powder or liquid or, you know, food, more so powders and liquids, if you do, if you do consume too much protein, your liver has a hard time breaking it down and processing it. And sometimes there can be, you know, um, calcium in your urine, which is like a worst extreme case where it's a sign of osteoporosis so there are are things there that you know really can be detrimental but can also be beneficial and so that's what you're looking at here and i could really see your brains whizzing and firing away in terms of answering that question and actually being able to use examples and grasping my points of going through um, the introductory sentence and linking how linking your ideas with the components of your response using the verb very well awesome students ask what carb loading is don't worry i'll get to that in a second and i will keep going um an example that i've got here is for vitamins and minerals on the screen supplementation is argued to be necessary slash appropriate if you want to use the words of the question for an athlete as these nutrition nutrients can be sourced through diet for example, iron is a component of meat and vitamin C is found in fruit. However, the need for supplementation stems from a deficiency in their body or at risk of a deficiency, right? This is exemplified through female, ath female athletes who may supplement the mineral iron as they risk anemia due to blood loss from menstruation. And then you might go on to say vitamin C is important because it is great for strengthening the immune system and allowing the athlete to acclimatize to different circumstances and ensure that their body can still function normally and, and whatever it may be. I You can also use um, vitamin D is a great example for a vitamin because vitamin D helps with the absorption of iron and it's funny because they connect together um, and you can gain vitamin D from the sun and things like that. So it is exciting. I um, am going to keep going. I have really, really enjoyed going through these questions so far. We are um, coming close to our break time. I know that your brains have been wiring and firing and I definitely will honor that. So don't worry too much in a second. We will give you that time. Let's Up until that point, let's go through this question here. Justify the use of distributed part practice for beginners. Now, this is a very... Interesting question. We've got our justifies, we've got our prove it point. So essentially it's saying here, the use of distributed part practice is good for beginners, right? And our question asks us to prove it. That's what we have to look at. So distributed part practice comes under our practice methods, which is found in our focus question four of our factors affecting performance syllabus. And we look at our um, different types of practice methods. We know that there are four. We know that there is part, distributed, massed, and whole. So we can go through them. But the, the purpose of this question here asks us to look at beginners and how we would approach those practice methods for beginners and how they can be beneficial. Now, I um, want to... Oh, I literally just answered the question. I got too excited, I jumped the gun, and I had basically told you the answer to the question that's just now up on your Slido, um, which is here up on your screen. Feel free to scan the code, or you can type in um, the numerical code. It's 2634897. What are the methods of practice? And, and you know, um, how many are there? And I literally just told you that. So testing your short-term memory, active recall. What did I just say? <laughs> and then pop them in the, there. In the, in the responses, we've got some fantastic students who have wonderful 
great ears that can pick up what I'm saying. So you've written that all down um, and it's fantastic to see that you are listening <laughs> in that sense. Um, keep the answers coming. I know that I sort of said them and I know that you know what the answers are, but it is great to know that uh, we're all on the same page. This is an example that I would use for this question. Well, as my introductory components of these questions, as it is a justify, justify is more so seen in terms of um, higher weighted questions, so like six, eight, seven, et cetera, I would try to define it and explain what it is that I'm talking about to be able to prove it. So part practice is the act of breaking down the skill into smaller sh- sections to practice. Distributed practice is where the session is broken down into small periods of work and longer periods of rest. For example, breaking down a layup in basketball into a dribbling section, a jumping section, and a shooting section will be very effective for beginners. It is important that they are able to perform all individual parts of this serial skill well and distributed part practice is very beneficial. So you can see here, I did. I, I basically said, this is what part practice and distributed practice is. And then that's how I've proved it. That's why it's beneficial for beginners. Beginners require things to be broken down. They're still learning all of the movements of the skill and how to be agile in basketball, for example, or to be able to, um, you know, process what's happening next and read the play of the game to to be aware, sorry, to be weary of their positioning on the, on the court and, and things like that. And it's really hard for a beginner who has not done that to be able to do all of that. So breaking things down into small sections to make it doable and little um, increments of the skill is really beneficial because you're, you're working. It's almost like you're building on what you know and what you have learned in the prior skill and using that for this skill. I've mentioned that it's a serial skill layout because serial is, um, we know that there are nine different types of natures of skill and there's um, fine, discrete, um, gross, and we've got uh, external, internally paced. We've got um, things like this discrete. We've got continuous. We've got all these different types of skills. And for example, a layup in basketball, it's like when they, dribble and they jump and they shoot and all in one I don't play basketball but that's something I tried to spice up my examples um you could even say something like you know a penalty shot in soccer or a um you know shooting in netball or um even like uh, a box jump in um the gym or I don't know plyometrics and things like that so it's always good to use your own examples that you can relate to or that you know really well this is just something that I've added to spice it up and maybe connect to some of you in the audience um so yeah hopefully that you can see that I've proved as to why it is important um this idea here that they're able to perform all individual parts of the skill well because then they can get to the entire skill. And this is only a, a, a small section of this question and who knows how much longer it can go for. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's rewind to this question. Um, we remember this question about progressive overload and explaining what it is and why it is used. And the example that I had here on the slide was adding one kilo of squat to um, an athlete's squat every time they go to the gym. And there were awesome responses in terms of increasing your time and, you know, increasing your speed and all of these things that we talked about just previously. Now, what I want to go through with this question, just want to see, is... Grab out your phones again. I'm very obsessed with my Slido (laughs) today. But I want to get you thinking about how to wrap it all up into a nice, beautiful package for the marker to be like, ta-da, I got you a present. Here's my answer to your awesome HSC question. And I've answered it well. So you will need to be able to think of on the spot, you know, in your own HSC, how to link back to the question. Yes, we've used our introductory sentence well and we've got our example and we've understood our directive verb, but how do we just wrap it up and finalize, make our response complete? What would um, you do to link it all back together and, and connect it and just, you know, finish up, add the full stop, move on to the next question? So this Slido poll that I've got up ready for you is 
a multiple choice question. I tried to spice it up <laughs> with our multitude of written responses and questions that have been asked. So this question on Slido asks you, what is an effective link back to this question? And I've got some options and I, and I want to see if you can gain, um, you know, if you can see the right way as an example to link back to the entire question. We've got awesome students who are nailing it and getting the question right. You can see exactly what I am talking about. And I tried to be a little bit silly with some of my linking sentences so that you could obviously distinguish which one directly links back to the question. There are some that say, so the thing does the thing, you know, that's not always ever going to be a good linking sentence because what is the thing does the what thing, you know, and it's really not clear and sophisticated. Um, progressive, you can say progressive overload is important, but it's always nice to just wrap it up um, like the first on my screen, I think it's the first option, option A. I don't know if that's the same for you, but this ensures that our psychological adaptations are continuously being made in response to resistance training. And that is important because it shows you once again, why it is used and like essentially what progressive overload does for an athlete. Well, it continues to uh, light up the psychological adaptations within their body and ensure that they're able to perform even better every time. Fantastic. We've got a variety of questions in our questions box, so I'm really excited to answer them really soon and I will do my best to answer them as all of them as much as I can. Let's go on to the next slide. I want you to write your own examples down and it doesn't need to be long, short, doesn't need to be complete sentences. I just want you to begin thinking about some examples that you could talk about. Um, and if you're comfortable, feel free to write them down in the Q&A section as just like a statement. And I'm more than happy to, you know, look at them and, and give you feedback. So I want you to finish this sentence with some of your own examples that you know off the top of your head. I mean, hopefully off the top of your head. So I've started to write here as my introductory sentence. We can sort of gauge what the question might be, but that's okay. We can just focus on our examples here. Medicare is the public health care system in Australia that covers the cost of many health services such as. What are some examples that you know that Medicare covers? It subsidizes GP visits. It has um, the PBS, the uh prescription um benefit scheme is it i think prescription something like that about like antibiotics and stuff uh, they're subsidized and they're made a lot cheaper there's things like what else i want to see what your brain knows so just write them down just make sure that you have access to them and i am hoping that you feel really confident really glad really proud of yourself with your examples as you begin to wrap up that sentence of your examples, it doesn't need to be many. You can you can mention like, you know, however, it does not cover the cost of um, elective surgeries or, you know, allied healthcare like physio or ambulance. Um, not deliveries, but drives. Like um, if you get injured or sick or something like that, an ambulance is, is called to come to you to pick you up to take you to the hospital, you have to pay out of pocket for that ambulance route. Anyway, next example. Intrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from within the athlete. For instance, think about some things that motivate you as a student. We can we can say that that's a form of being an athlete because you're studying for the HSC and you've got all of this work to do beforehand and that's your big day of performance. What motivates you? What are some things that maybe you are inspired by? by by some of your favorite athletes or some of your favorite people how are they motivated intrinsically i know for me for example um i am intrinsically motivated by my consistency i work hard i can do this i i'm, I'm gonna be good and every time i'm gonna get better and and that's okay i recently injured my knee and I have been doing my rehab and all of these things and I'm walking and I'm moving and I'm great and it's fine. So my intrinsic motivation to keep doing my rehab is, well, look how much progression my 
knee has already gained let's keep going so we can gain more movement and gain more fluidity and ease of motion and stuff like that that's for me what would be your intrinsic motion motivation what would your examples be I hope that you find this helpful and I hope that it's really forcing you to think on the spot and, and think on your feet. I know that we go through bouts of of mental exhaustion in this period of before the HSC and that's so valid and so real and definitely something that I relate to. But it is great to feel like, oh, there is something I can do right now, right in this moment that can just get me started and, and you begin to turn that wheel of energy again for our HSC. Let's go to the next slide. Our break time. So it's long awaited and it is right on par with my rest of timeline for the lecture today. I usually have a track record of going, um, rushing the end component of my lecture because I dive into so much in the middle, but I'm really happy with how things are going today. And I'm really obsessed with your awesome engagement and interaction with me and in with the lecture. It shows that you're engaging, you're listening, you're um, really just sponging and absorbing everything that I'm saying. And it's really great to feel um, a part of this, this network that we've built today. So that's awesome. Today, I just want you to like take some time, go go to the bathroom, um, grab some snacks, grab a water, um, stretch your legs, shake it out, do whatever you need to do, listen to a song that gets you hyped. This is your break time and I want to honor that for you. You definitely have worked very hard in this first period of our lecture today and I'm very excited to see um, all of your hard work continue in our second component. There are some things I just want to mention um, in relation to our break. And I uh, previously at the beginning of our lecture touched on them, but I want to dive into them a little bit more. So they're my chance to swim. So I um, just want to once again thank all of our university sponsors for allowing this to happen. Um, I'm going to go through some of our points on the bottom left-hand side there about at Unlimited, Shoot Smart. Like I mentioned, this is where it's going to get clear and easy to understand. Um, so, you know, everything that you, you, sorry, um, we know we know as part of a Tunnets and Tute Smart that there is tutoring available for students just like yourself, where it's group tutoring and also one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So this one-on-one -on -one tutoring is performed online. Sessions are in depth and go for sixty minutes. Sessions are weekly or however often you would like, and you pay as you go. Um, it's really flexible and then it's really easy to uh, add into your daily life. And I really find that it is helpful from the students that I have. Once again, all of our tutors like myself, are high achieving grads that know their subjects inside out. For example, I tutor English, Standard Advanced and Extension, Legal Studies, PE, Studies of Religion 1 and 2. So they are my areas of expertise and I hope to see you sometime soon and meet you in person before your HSC if you need. Um, if you want that extra push, get ready for exams or just need help with your studies and motivation, definitely find out more about our private tutoring by booking a quick info call with us and you'll be able to get the inside scoop and, and make that booking, which is super exciting. We also have something called Ed Unlimited, which is something that you may have heard of, may have used, may be an avid love of, lover of, and it's literally where you can access every single ATAR Notes book all online in one place. It's a little bit like Netflix, but for study guides. So it's very cool and very vibey. Um, it's every single A ton notes title plus other resources. It's very just comprehensive, but unlike Netflix, these things don't go away each month. And you know, it's all there for you. It's great value for a small monthly subscription fee, and you can test it out free for the next 21 days or the next three weeks by using my unique code Zafira HSC. Z-A-F-I-R-A and just enter the code when you're subscribing. Make sure you check it out. 21 days free. You've got nothing to lose. It will help you massively for your upcoming exams and you can access so much free content, which is so exciting. And of course, we also have our study guides printed in physical copies too. So all of our study guides are written by elite graduates who know their subjects inside out. And they're full of tips and tricks to help you really quickly understand the content and maximize your marks for your upcoming exams. 
So we are offering a fantastic discount on all of our products. Please use this discount here to get 15% off of your purchases. It's 15 SEP uh, and use that code and, and you'll be able to pop that in the checkout. The link's in the sidebar there and it'll be really easy for you to show yourself and anything that you may be thinking about that you have got your HSC in the bag. I still want to use this time, keep being on your break. <laughs> I still want to, I want to use this time to answer some questions. So we've got some questions here. Um, great question from a student about the different types of directive verbs and the questions. How do we not confuse the verbs assess and compare? It seems like there's a thin line that differs, that defers the two. Fantastic question. And you know what? Great observation. Yes. Assess comes through our brains of weighing up pros and cons, good and bad. And we have to say, you know, this is one aspect of this um, area of focus. This is another. Compare is different because you're showing similarities and differences. So you're showing what they have in common, but what they also lack significantly. And the difference between the two is compare is more so used for a lower mark response like three, four, five, um, and assess is more predominantly used at the back end, six, seven, eight, and it's it's a higher order question. You've got a lot more um, room in your assess question to dive into the nitty gritty as well. You would need to come up with like a final point of evaluation, right? So for assess, you're saying this is both sides and this is why it is effective. This is both sides and that is why it is not as effective or as appropriate etc etc with compare you're essentially just showing the differences and the similarities you're looking at things words like in comparison to um, which differs from which um you know is contrasted with um all of those types of things it just i guess to really finalize that question and i hope that i've answered it for you is that it is um compare is more so used for the lower end marks it's like a short little grab of information and insight into yep can you identify this and this whereas assess is can you identify this and this but can you go into why hope that makes sense there too um how do you best maximize marks in short answer questions i always lose like one mark even if i know the content that comes down to your understanding of the directive verb just based on how you've written that question i don't know you and i would love to but it is something that um, definitely is an experience for many students and it's very real and very valid. How I would help you with that is know your content, but be able to adapt it and be able to expose yourself to different types of questions. Just go on to Nessa, look at the different past papers, look at even your trial paper, look at the different types of questions and instantly in the back of your head, think of how you would approach it and how you would connect it to this unseen question. We can have the same content area for many different questions. For example, we might get asked about Ottawa Charter and its initiatives and healthcare and, and every health promotion in two different questions, but the questions will be asking you about different things. And so it's important to pick up on that directive verb, whether it is asking you to explain and show a relationship between the two, or if it's asking you to justify and prove that it's actually effective, or whether it's asking you to describe and essentially just show me in its entirety, whether it's asking you to, to what extent to show me, has it been impactful? Make a judgment here. Those things will really differentiate how you can link your um, content to the question and ultimately gain that full marks. It also comes down to how you write. So it's ensuring that your words are clear, easy to read, the sentences flow, and it just adds on to the next point. It's, it's almost like a spiral and you're just drawing and connecting all of the ideas together. Sometimes when we write in exams, we can be going crazy. Our adrenaline is moving a million miles an hour and it's like bang, bang, bang. Um, just get the words out onto the page. That can be really hard to, you know, work through and control in terms of um, ensuring that your clarity is there and that your your content is clear and stuff like that. So being able to expose yourself to different types of timed conditions, seeing different questions is great because you're able to build on that exam stress, that exam adrenaline and actually get used to it and sit with it and be like, you know, what? it doesn't actually stress me out because I've done this before. 
when I was doing my HSC, on the days of my exam, I literally was excited. I was just, I was calm, I was relaxed. Everyone around me was very stressed, very anxious, very loud and, and really just trying to gain as much information as possible in the last 20 minutes before the doors were going to open. And I was just really calm because I had sat with and had practiced many times sitting under time conditions and being able to um, like write essentially. And when I got to the HSC in my head, I'm like, it's just another practice. I've done this before. So this is exactly what it's like. It's nothing different. It's nothing crazy. I've practiced this, so I know what I'm doing. That will really help with how you would best maximize your marks um, as well. Um, is there a chance we could have access to your acronyms? You can. Please book in a private tutoring session with me and I will be able to give them to you personally. <laughs> but uh, for some of them so far that I've mentioned, you can always rewind the lecture that will be recorded and you'll be able to just rewrite them down, RSVP to Weddings or Dipsy Sub or um, CAT, whatever it is that I have. You can make up your own acronyms too, but I am more than happy to give you my acronyms in a private tutoring session. <laughs> I hope that that helps. Um, I So um, a student has asked, would you say that an intro is necessary for anything above a three marker? Yeah, that's a great way to really summarize what I said. <laughs> um, thank you. I will take notes for next time. Um, but you would obviously write an introductory sentence differently in comparison to the question. So obviously if your question asks you to what extent, you're going to start off your introductory sentence with a judgment, with a effective or ineffective right there, significantly, whatever. Um, if your question asks you to compare, you could say the differences between, whatever. You get really straight into it. You just need a little introductory word or so to get the flow going. Um, and I know I myself had a lot of difficulty with speaking too much in my responses and, and trying to like get to my point really quickly. I find that I still have that problem now, but that's fine. In the HSC, I learned to go through my introductions and be really meticulous about them. Am I adapting them to be longer or shorter? Are they quite specific and really just start my my essay my essay my response off with the bang or do i need more sentences to explain what i'm going to talk about and then i get into my response it's really just making sure that you know how to begin writing that sentence so yes i definitely say an intro after three marks is necessary um we've got some questions here about study tips for the hsd from now on i'll get into that in a second um we've got some students who had written uh, bulk billing and medical costs for some of their examples for um, that Medicare question. Fantastic examples. And I'm very, very excited to know that you are on par with your content. We've got another student who has intrinsic motivation and examples, um, success and achievement to break a personal best. That is a fantastic example. Um, and I really, really love that you're able to connect all of that together. We've got a student that... Um, has mentioned, and I'm very, very grateful for your uh, bravery here to be able to say how you're feeling with exams and, and, and anxiety and how stressful it is. I'm very sorry to hear that it, it does get really intense for you. I wish that I could take that all away. I know that it's definitely something that um, I went through myself and I know that a lot of people are going through. Like I said, um, I, no, I, sorry, not like I said, my, my brother's in his HSC year at the moment too. And I can definitely see it in him and in his friends and, and, and things like that around him. It is a very, very stressful and anxious time. And I don't like how, um, how the HSC has been deemed, you know, be all end all, but it's really not. And I don't want you to think that. And I know that it can be hard to, to, to think that and it's easier to say, I understand. But some strategies that I have before an exam, and don't laugh, but this is something that I would do every single time I had an exam. I made a playlist on Spotify and I think it was called You Got It Girl or something like that. And it was just a hype up of like four songs where I would listen to one word or one verse that really just made me feel enough for the exam and ready. There was a song by um, Drake, and Chris Brown, and I, it's called, oh, it slipped my mind, but there's a there's a word and it says, you got it, girl. Um, and I loved that. I was like, yes, thank you. I've got this. There was another song that there I had in this playlist and it was 
Go Crazy by Chris Brown. You can tell who I like. Um, Chris Brown in this song says, everything you do is amazing. And I was like, yes, everything I write is amazing. Everything I, I think is amazing. Yes, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. There was another song um, by Drake and it's, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so proud of you. And it's like, yes, yes, yes. All of my hard work is coming and I'm proud of myself. Everything I do is amazing. I can write, I can do this. I got this. I'm proud of me. Like, and, and that was always good. I would make sure the night before I had my pens in my little bag, my little Ziploc bag. I would take like a million pens because I was so worried that they were all going to run out on me. Um, I would set myself up for the day um, by eating something for breakfast. If, if you get really sick in the mornings, don't eat anything. Um, another thing that I could recommend is if you like maybe set a time of 15 minutes earlier on your alarm, wake up that 15 minutes earlier and spend 10 minutes just writing. Just get a notepad and be like, so today is my day of my HSC. Just begin to get your hand moving, almost like a warm up for your muscles. So that that way, when you get into the exam, you're not like, <laughs> and then your hand is rigid and you're unable to move. You want it to make sure that it is quite loose and, and fluid and, and able to just move with the paper and, and keep going. Um, another thing to try is definitely practicing timed responses at home in your room, in your desk, wherever it is, I use my dining table and you can definitely go and um, begin to familiarize yourself. It's what I was mentioning before. Begin to familiarize yourself with how exams feel. And yes, they can be nerve wracking. Give yourself um, a random exam question and um, I would write them down on pieces of paper and I would just pick a random section, like any meaning, my mo. I'd close my eyes, pick a paper. That would be my random question. And then I would just write down on a notepad, you know, my response. And I would always time myself because it made me feel comfortable with, ah, I'm being timed. There's like time is running out and I need to quickly write and, and all of those types of feelings and emotions that are really valid with the HSC. Um, I know that those tips might not take away the anxiety that happens before exams. I do hope that it feel it feels a little bit easier for you to manage um, and it feels more, okay, I, I, um, I'm scared because I don't know what the questions are going to be and that's okay. I have prepared myself with many different unseen questions. I'm ready for this. I've got this. Everything I write is amazing and you can, you know, use those songs if you want um, or any other songs that you recommend that you think hype you up, let me know and I can add them to my list. Thank you. Um, I do hope that that helps, but, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, we're more than happy to talk about that um, through private tutoring or through, um, you know, group tutoring or anything like that. We're here for you. And uh, yes, so I loved all your questions and I definitely think that I um, have answered a lot. But let's get through again to our amazing lecture. Let's go on to part two. And a lot of what was asked in the question section just now about, you know, maximizing responses for short answers and then stress for um, writing and stuff like that. We're going to address now. Okay. We have here in our section four practice questions. So our brains, like I've been saying, yours are fantastically spongy and absorbent and grasping everything that I'm saying. It's great to see. So today we're going to write. Now, I want you to take a breath. It is not going to be marked. I cannot see your writing. Um, I am just a little hype up on your shoulder. Like, woo, you got this. I'm your cheerleader. Don't feel like you need to... Um, oh, well, see, I made a typo there. Anyway, um, I guess it shows you that it's okay to um, just do this as you are, as you do. So I want to... Get those pens and papers out. We're going to be physically writing, writing, and I am going to be timing you. Don't worry, it is not going to be super long responses and they're relatively easy to be like, oh yeah, yeah, this is cool. Thanks for the warm up. I'm ready. I've dipped my toes in. It's good. I want you to think about when you are seeing these questions. Do you need an intro sentence? What is the verb asking you to do? Do you have an example? Now, before you see these unseen questions, the first point of contact I want you to look at is the marks. 
how much do I need to write? My PE teacher, I don't know if anyone is here from my school. Um, I was at Mary McKillop Catholic College. But Mr. Crosby, shout out to him. He said that I needed to be a real estate agent of my question. That meant that I need to look at how much marks it was worth and give it value. How much can I give to this house of a question, right? How much, how much can I offer? That will, that will allow you to begin prepping your brain to say, yep, this is how much I have to write. This is what I'm going to talk about. This is the value of this question. This is what it is worth. So first point of contact, always, 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 always is the marks. Straight at the end of the question, you need to look at the marks. Then you go on a diagonal point and look at the directive verb. What exactly do you need to do? Explain, show a relationship. Do you need to justify and prove it? Do you need to describe and show characteristics? Do you need to outline and list and sketch in detail? Uh, sorry, in brief detail. Do you need to assess? Do you need to compare? What exactly do you need to do? That's your second point of call. Then for number three, then you read the whole point the whole question and look at the content areas of the syllabus. And in your brain, like I was doing today, try and map out exactly where it was in the syllabus. Focus question three, um, this is of factors, this is dot point two, like everything like that on the right hand side of the syllabus, that's what it's asking me to do, that's what I need to know. So I'm gonna recap over that again. Before you see a question and before you respond, this is gonna happen instantaneously in your brain. Before you see a question, you need to look at the marks, be a real estate agent of your question. How much is it worth? Go to your verb. What is it actually asking of you to do? And then go on to your content areas in the syllabus. Yep, that's health priorities, focus question three. That's the SPPC criteria, focus question one. That's focus question four, factors. That's um, focus question one, factors. Whatever it is, you need to be able to pinpoint the marks, the directive verb, and the syllabus. That is how you will get to do you need an intro? What is the verb asking you to do? Do you have an example? Okay. Now, I've sort of built up this anticipation now, and I hope that you are feeling excited to write. And it is good because you are not alone, and I'm here with you. And like I said, I am very good at being a cheerleader, hyping you up on your shoulder. So, uh, or on your little laptop screen. Let's get started. Take a breath, have your pens ready. I'm going to time you just to get you beginning to feel ready because you are ready. You've shown me that you're ready and, and I have so much confidence that you are ready and that you are confident in yourself. I know you know what you're talking about. Alrighty, let's get started. Our first question is, what are the advantages to Australians of having a public health care system? Notice the marks, notice the verb, notice the content area. This is a three marker. So I'm going to give you five minutes of your time and I just want you to write this response as best as you can. You have the question up on your screen. I'm not going to be talking, I promise. I'll make it as much of an exam simulation as possible. Your time starts now.
I'm doing great. Got a minute to go. Last 10 seconds. Okay, so just finish up your last point there. Um, the time has gone off. That was five minutes of your beautiful brain power. So thank you for sharing that with me. I hope that you were able to answer this question. I know that the verb in this point in this question is not as explicit as the other ones that we looked at, but I hope that you could pinpoint exactly what the question was asking of you. What are the advantages? That to me shows or describe the advantages of Australians having a public health care system. I hope that you were able to feel proud of yourself and use some great examples in this question here. There are some points that you should have mentioned, things that it is, you know, accessible, that it is quite comprehensive, that it is multidimensional, that it um, is designed to help the people as diverse as people are. Um, and it caters to that level of diversity, especially in Australia. There are heaps and heaps of other points that you could have mentioned. It is a three marker, so you don't need to go into the most amount of detail but if you're comfortable feel free to pop in the q a section of our slido some of your points that you had written down um because i am definitely feeling a very high energy buzz that comes from practicing writing and, and almost being like okay i've started the balls rolling let's keep going now we do have some more time and i i have a lot of questions here for practice you will have the opportunity to go through those practice questions in your own time. You know, should you wish, they're all there. These questions on all of the ones that you have seen so far are previous HSC questions. So they are what's been in the HSC. It gives you a little bit more groundwork so that you know what to expect and it can hopefully ease some of those nerves that come with being a HSC student. Um, let's go through another question. Are you up for another question? I think, yes, let's keep going. So here we have, but before we do that, I want to go through, um, the syllabus point here. So this is focus question three of our healthcare system in Australia in health priorities core one. So we have a lot of dot points here to go through and you can definitely mention Medicare. You can mention um, the idea that it is equitable, that there is almost a balanced level of responsibility and it's quite, um, well, the word I'm thinking of is utilitarian. That essentially means for the good of the greater, for the greater good, like for all the people. So it's like, you know, helpful and um, beneficial and it's, positively designed to look after the people it was meant to serve you know things like that um so that's the syllabus dot point there let's go through another question and this one i believe is from factors how can flexibility improve performance this is another three marker and i i apologize that that's not explicit on the screen but it is a three marker so first we need to look at the marks we need to look at the verb we need to look at our content point area within our syllabus and be able to pinpoint exactly where it is asking of us. So because it is a three marker, I'm going to time you again with five minutes. So here is your question. Shake out your hand, write down on a new line, question two, <laughs> and your time starts now. Off you go.
you are whizzing away. We're almost halfway through. Two minutes and 30 seconds to go. Last 10 seconds. Alrighty. You finished two practice questions. You are on fire. I'm very proud of you and I hope that you're proud of yourselves too. I hope that you were also able to notice that this question asks an implicit verb, how. When I say how, I think of explain. Show me how. Show me, show me why. Show me how. You know? So explain how flexibility can improve athletic performance. You should have mentioned things like on the syllabus here, we can identify that it is in focus question one of our factors affecting performance syllabus. And it relates to things like this one here, flexibility. Static, ballistic, PNF dynamic, and the purposes of that are things like enhanced mobility, um, moving in range of motion with ease, being pain free, um, like long term longevity of movement, reduction of injury. We've got um, maybe you can think of an example like walking every day or something like that, or um, ensuring that you stretch your muscles before and after movement so as to preserve their you know muscular function and, and capacity and power in the same way um, if you're comfortable again please feel free to write down in our chat and our q a any points that you've written and talked about i'm sure that they're all correct and on the money which is great um i have way more questions and i do want to just show you them i'm not going to time you anymore i promise um if you want to do these in yourself i would recommend that you time them yourself and just see how you go timed in that situation it's like an exam simulation but some of these other questions that i have i do want to go through some studying hacks and trips and ticks and tips and tricks and answer any more questions that you may have we know that there are lots um, so our students just asked for this prior question here, would you only need one advantage in an example? Yes.
because it is three marks. So you need to allocate your time wisely to the words that and the space given to you. Um, you would maybe say one advantage, like increased range of motion. Uh, I would maybe say maybe two advantages, like increased range of motion, motion and reduced potential for injury, um, which is always good. And then you might say, for example, a uh, soccer player warming up before their game um, allows their body to just prepare for the game at hand or something like that. I, I agree and you agree with me too. Would you only need one advantage? You can have one to two. It's, it's um, okay to do that um, in an example. So fantastic. And I'm very proud that you're picking up everything like that. Um Awesome. These are some of the other questions that I have. You can do these in your own time. It's an eight marker. So that's our first point. Why? Justify. Why is it important for athletes to develop the elements of performance? So looking at it's important for athletes to develop the elements of performance because. Prove it. Tell me why. That's how I sort of see this response. You would be time yourself. I would maybe give yourself, oh, like 10 minutes for an eight marker, um, 10 to 12 minutes maximum. And you can, you can definitely talk about the impact of element, sorry, elements of performance, decision-making, strategic and tactical development. Well, that is things like looking at, you know, asking questions and being able to assess the actual play of the game and be able to say to yourself and to your team, it's collaborative approach. You know, what happens if this player goes here? What do we do? How do we protect our game? It's almost like a pathway to win. That's the whole point of our performance elements, looking at our strategy. So it's like our game plan and tactical development is things like, you know, your questioning, your um, creativity and your adaptability to be able to respond to different circumstances in the game. Um, let's say you've got a really, I'm going to use a soccer example because of my brother. So He's a left back. So let's say you, you, like he is defending a really, um, you know, angry and aggressive um, midfielder or striker or something like that on the op opposite team. How would he be able to respond? How would he be able to get the ball and, you know, um, make the play effective and use his team to support him? Can I pass to you? Can you meet me over there? You can see where I'm going with this play, you know, so I can remove myself from this 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 awesome player who's really aggressive so that I can also um, emulate our game plan things like that so that's for this question why is it important it's important because why do you think it's important it's pretty obvious well for teamwork for encouragement for actual practice and precision of the skills that you've learned in the sport that you play specifically for sport group group sports and even individual sports it's important to allow um your team that i guess holistic performance that they deserve and that they work so hard for it is an indication of your autonomous capacity to be quite skillful in your field um it shows that you have a highly highly powerful level of precision and technical efficiency and adaptability and almost anticipation kinesthetic sense of what the game is actually going to happen and play and present itself as so hope that that all are some points of thought for your practice one day when you go in to answer those questions. Another question I've got here is a five marker. Discuss the impact of emerging new treatments and technologies in relation to healthcare in Australia. Now, discuss is not one of the verbs that was on our list of eight today, but discuss is essentially very similar to assess and evaluate and, and make a judgment to what extent. You're basically showing me both sides. Um, and I know it may sound confusing to have all these similar aspects of ways to answer questions that are very, that have different verbs, but it just comes with practice. The more that you can recognize them and, and things like that, you'll be able to really nail home that way to write the response for them. So you will be able to, um, Uh, there there are definite sorry we just received an influx of questions coming through and I'm just seeing them all now um in in terms of answering this question you would need to show me um the benefits and the disadvantages so the pros and cons both sides so the impact of new emerging treatments is fantastic because we've got all these early diagnostical measures we've got preventative points at play we've got fantastic 
expenditures of money in prevention. We've got all these things, but our emerging new treatments are expensive and they create a further disparity between those of low SES economic capacity or status to be able to afford and access healthcare, to be able to access that prevention. So it's quite a barrier. You can see that it acts as a dividing mechanism instead of a uniting mechanism. So maybe there could be points of making it more accessible, but you would need to look at both sides. Is it effective? Yes. Is it ineffective? Well, yeah, to some extent, there is some negative, as negative aspects to it. And you will time yourself. I'd give yourself maximum eight marks to do a five, five marker. Now, um, that was just some of the examples that were here. I realize I didn't put the syllabus dot point there, but that is from focus question three of our syllabus. And it is on a prior slide. I'll show you now. Here, we can see if you follow my mouse, impact of emerging new treatments and technologies on healthcare, cost and access benefits of early detection. So that is focus question three of um, health priorities. So you can use that same syllabus knowledge for this question. Oops. Next question for well, this question, and you'll be able to really answer that question. Hit the hammer on its head. Now, I've got a lot of questions about what do we do from now till the HSC? Okay, what can I do like before the HSC? What are some strategies that I have and things like that? That's what we're going to talk about in the next slide. You saw the preview of that. But the HSC is about a couple of weeks away, I believe. I know that the last day of the HSC is in 37 days. So that might be exciting to know that soon it's going to be over. This time-ish also next month, <laughs> November. Um, there are a couple of months. So you may be feeling like, what do I do now? How do I get myself into gear? What are, I'm home alone. I'm really finding it hard to study. Um, it's easy to be just not studying and I get that I really really do but the first thing that you've done and that you have successfully all done is come to this lecture it's a very very good bouncing catalyst launch pad for the HSE because we go we went through some studying um points we practice to practice questions so that's a really awesome hats off for you all today and we went through some introductory purposes some examples some verbs we really broke down what it is that is being asked of us so that's a great first step now there are some aspects of studying that can be really exhausting and boring and then you do them for so long and you're like I'm so over them and I completely understand you have no idea how many times I used to cry over sitting at my um, dining table because I was doing all these practice papers every day and I was like I'm so over it I can't sit there anymore so I completely get it but I was able to attend my own I was able to attend lectures myself and it's weird now actually it's not weird it's really cool being on the other end and being able to deliver these lectures to help you the way that I was helped as well. So past papers, like we did today, don't always necessarily need to be in the form of the Nessa HSC format. It can be very um, boring and like athletes need variety in their training, we also as students need athletes in our variety. We also as students, that sounded so better in my head and my mouth was too quickly, was moving too fast. So we as students need variety to be studying for the HSC because it can really impact our motivation levels the more that we switch it up a little bit here and there. So hopefully today you were able to see a different version of practice papers and you were able to expose yourself to unseen questions and respond instant instinctively instinctively and be able to just you know formulate a response that comes to your head. You're able to grasp the content of the syllabus and pinpoint where it is. You're able to understand where the verb asks you to go and you know following that direction in that path. They are a great way. Um, like I mentioned before, you can do things where you write them down on a piece of paper and do like an eeny, meeny, miny, mo and just grab that HSC question. You can um, make up a list of all of the old possible HSC questions and literally just scroll through and close your eyes and pick a, pick a question and write it down, have that ready to go. I always told my family, Guys, no talking. I'm doing a practice exam. And they're like, again? I'm like, yes, that's it. I, I need to um, tie myself. I need to be in silence. I need to really pretend like I'm in an exam. And they're like, yep, no worries. That's fine. 
group study is good and working with others is good. It shows you that you know your content well enough to teach and to explain and to help other people solidify their own understanding of their content, which is fantastic. You can even do things like um, over Zoom, over um, at the park or whatever it is, and you can just literally talk to each other about the content. You can have a whiteboard set up. I really love whiteboards. They're fun. Um, you can even just talk to your pet, talk to your brother, talk to your sibling, talk to whoever, and just tell them the content. Tell them how much you know they um, haven't studied those subjects like you, so they won't be able to say that's wrong or that's not true or anything like that. Um, know that you will know your content and it'll be so much easier for you. It's important as well, like I've been mentioning and honing on today, that the syllabus is something that you can see in your head at all times. Um, you can do things like closed passages where you have your syllabus next to you and on a different piece of paper, you you write out like focus question one, um, you know, whatever the, focus, the question is called. Then you have your first dot point nature of um, or not nature of that sports medicine again, but you would have things like, um, I don't know, Ottawa Charter or whatever it is. And then you have the three dot points underneath Ottawa Charter and you, you have like dot, 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 lines of words that need to be filled. And it really forces your brain to do active recall and go through a process of, um, remembering what the, what content is stored in our long-term memory and trying to be able to pinpoint on that syllabus where it is. That's how I'm able to know that's the third dot point from this side, that's on the left-hand side, because I really was able to memorize that syllabus and that closed passage really helped me. So definitely try that if you think that that would work. Another way you could try um, learning the syllabus is through flashcards. Um, there's online platforms like Quizlet that are really great in terms of making digital flashcards. So you can have the name of the syllabus dot point on one side and before you flip it over onto the other side where it tells you what the dot points are, you would recall them and you would say them out loud. Always, always, always say them out loud because that helps your brain hear what you are talking about and it makes your brain focus on what you are saying. We often in uh, making a general statement by saying we, but can overthink in our brains and can really just spiral and go over a million different thoughts in a million miles an hour. And if we talk at, about them out loud, we can really hone in on what it is that our brain is thinking to focus on what we are saying to then write what we are thinking. It's great. Um, some other steps that you can do. Um, I actually really love studying for PE. It can be fun. Today was a point of practice for me when I was in your shoes two years ago. You can add so much more um, variety. Like I said before, like athletes need it for their training. We need it too for our studying. You can do things like flashcards. Um, you can do things through a verbal uh, practice and recollection. I love to talk if you can't tell and I would stand I would I would go into my room and I would just talk in the mirror and I would say so this is the content for today and I would pretend to be hosting a stage of an audience you can do that um you can pretend to you know, sorry not pretend you can record yourself saying the content and just listen to it over and over again like how we listen to songs and, and know all the words same sort of thing you can you can talk to a friend to your mirror to yourself to your pet I always used to go after every single day, I would go into my room and I would say, okay, so today I went and did two PE practice questions. One was about the um, advantages of being in a public healthcare system in Australia. And the other one was about flexibility. So for the one about uh, Medicare and advantages, I talked about how it's accessible and there's, um, you know, PBS and, and things like that, Medicare and subsidized and it caters to all people. And then for flexibility, I talked about range of motion and I talked about prevention of injury. And I gave an example. My example was this. You go and you just literally repeat everything that you've said. It really just cements it in your brain. And it's like, yes, we're going to keep it in our brains for a while um, and it's still two years later I can you know this content inside out. Uh, multiple choice is fantastic and it's a really really great way to gain a lot of marks. Um, it's quite an easy opportunity for you to show off your skills. Nesta has an awesome multiple choice quiz function that you can access via the link in the slides and it's set up there directly for you. So all you need to do is find your subjects for PE and you can customize your exam so that it is you know up to 10 to 100 questions. You can go from 2018, I think it's to 2013 in terms of the HSC past papers. I know that it's not as recent what? as um, 2019 and 2020 and 2021, but you can still do those in your own time. 
There's heaps and heaps of um, like cahoots and stuff that you can do or you even just type in like P health priorities quizzes and then like random ones will come up on your um, internet browser and like some that I've done are really fun. They've got like memes and they have like sounds and these points and it's a little bit like Kahoot but it's not Kahoot, you know, so you can do all of those things too and sometimes Planning a response is just as effective as writing a whole response from scratch. So you would still go through that process of seeing an unseen question and seeing something and timing yourself uh, when to plan. Give yourself maybe a minute, two minutes maximum um, and literally just say, okay, like what you would write in dot points. It shows your brain that A, you know the content, B, you can answer the question and C, you know how to write you're just doing it in an easier way for your brain. <laughs> and, you know, when you get to the HSC, hopefully you'll be like me and be like, you know, I've done this before. It's fine. I got this. I know how to approach unseen questions. I know what I'm going to write. I know my content. I know I can adapt it to each question. I know I've got my examples and I know I'm fine. I've practiced this. Planning is really, really great. It also sets you up for faster reaction time so that that way you can see the question, begin to identify the syllabus, identify examples, identify the verb, identify its connecting buzzwords, and all those types of things come really, really hand in hand. The more you do it, the faster you get, the longer you have at the end of your exam to look back over your response, read it and see, yes, is it flowing? Is it making sense? Is it short, straight to the point? Have I, have I got my example? Do I have an introductory sentence if it's needed? Have I linked back to the question? Have I, um, you know, talked enough about this point on the lines that are given to me? Um, is this word, like, where can I see the marks? You put on that marker framework and that marker hat because you're so used to seeing different types of questions and responding to them instantly. In the exam, these are some of my absolutely must-dos. Please read the question. And you're probably like, yes, Zafira, everyone tells us to read the question. Yes, because there is a point. <laughs> we need to read the question. Like we saw today, there are three points of the question that come through just by reading it. We need to be able to identify in order to answer correctly and powerfully. So read the question first. Make sure that you you look at the words and if it's not registering in your head, read it again. That's what reading time is there for and it's okay to read in that time. I would personally start from the front and work your way back. Other people have said it's really effective for me to know what my option questions are first and then go and do multiple choice because I know what I'm in my brain subconsciously in the far back ends of it. I'm thinking about sports med and young people or I'm thinking about um, health uh, priorities, SPAS or Sport Australian Physical Activity and, and Australian Society and things like that. And I'm thinking about them as I'm beginning to write and work through my exam. You're allowed to plan. There is space on the actual exam that is bordered with what will be scanned and that will show the markers exactly what is written. Outside of those borders, you can do whatever it is that you would like. It's not going to be taken um, a picture. It's not going to be scanned. It's not going to be considered. So you can plan. And it actually shows the marker a little bit more insight into who you are as a person and your brain as opposed to the student number that is allocated to you. Um, it... You can also, you know, underline the verbs and, and circle things and cross things out and you can you can make your paper alive with the way that your brain is trying to process what is happening. And like I said before, you need to allow enough time, minimum five minutes, to go over your entire paper again, read through it, check multiple choice, check have you answered this question Check if you've left a question and come back to it, come back to it. Check that you've, you know, hit all your points. If you've got extra writing booklets, put them all together, make sure it makes sense and it's clear. You need that time to just cement to yourself that, yep, I've done this. This is the best I can do. Everything I've written is amazing and I'm so proud of me because look at how I've done it. I hope that they are my top three tips that you can take home with you and up until this period of practicing and revision until the HSC, you can begin to implement them and see them come into fruition. Now I am handing over the microphone to you. We've got some questions here that are very similar to what I've just been speaking about. So um, I can just repeat them again, but I, you know, now is your chance to ask me any questions. Um, I'll answer that student's question about what is carb loading again. Carb loading is a two-stage process in uh, factors affecting performance 
that we look at in our focus question three under nutritional considerations. It's our first dot point there of that syllabus on the left hand side. We have to look at pre, post and during the event performance. We have to look at fluid intake. Now carbohydrate loading is when you are going your first phase. You are going through um, a lot of carbs, right? You're eating a lot more carbs. You, I think it's about 15% um, of your body weight. Um, you convert it to kilograms or something like that in carbs. Don't worry too much about the scientific intricacies behind it. All you need to know is there's a higher consumption of carbohydrates throughout the lead up to the event, at least like, you know, I think it's uh, like about a week beforehand, you're really trying to in increase your intake of carbohydrates. So whether it be like spaghetti bolognese or, you know, chicken and rice or um, meat pies, um, they're quite carb carby, sweet potatoes, um, burrito bowls and stuff like that. All of those foods that we, you know, can eat to really increase our uptake of carbohydrate energy. It's to help our body store as much energy in carbohydrates as possible more so for endurance um aerobic events where you would need to withstand for long periods of time then the second phase is when you're not training um and you're trying to really preserve the, like the, the three days up until that point you really need to just make sure that you are moving yes but not like exerting yourself physically and and you know removing all of that stored energy so that on the day of your event or on the competition or the performance or whatever it is, you can really hone in and access on those carbohydrate uh, stores and just use that energy. So I hope that that is clear for that student that asked what carbohydrate loading is. Um, and some students have asked, what strategies would you recommend specifically for HSC? Explain the topic. Um, so, so for the HSC component and strategies there, definitely go over flashcards and, and speaking out loud and, and planning your responses. Definitely, definitely, definitely doing that under time conditions as well. Um, go back again and re-listen to those slides uh, and those points that I had mentioned over those slides too. Another student has asked, can I explain the topic of muscle hypertrophy and that whole dot point really quickly? Of course, hypertrophy just means growth, <laughs> muscle size, you know, and, and making that bigger. Um, there's a lot of intricacies that happen with like the fascia, the muscle tissue underneath it and things like that. Don't worry too much about that. But essentially there is different types of muscle growth, strength, power, endurance, um, and size, right? So strength is like how much you can lift size, the shape of your muscles and how they look, how big they are. Um, power, how, how, much you can move them how well you can move them and endurance how long they can last you know so for example if you are doing something more so for resistance based training muscle hypertrophy occurs where you are able to um implement progressive overload and you know for example they like lower weights sorry lower reps higher weight so that you can really just push your muscle to its max um you can do things for higher reps, like 12, 15, 20 reps, really lightweight, that's to help with muscle endurance. Um, you can even do things like, um, you know, plyometrics and stuff like box jumps, jumping lunges and stuff to help with muscle power. Um, for in terms of aerobic, you could do things like, well, making sure that you can be able to run 10 kilometers. That's a muscle endurance, also of your heart, but also of your legs and your body and things like that. Um, muscle strength, you might be able to practice in long jump, being able to, you know, hold your body in that, you know, lower squatting position to be able to jump and the power that comes from that, you might be able to practice propelling yourself up higher and higher. Essentially hypertrophy for muscles. Let me just quickly recap is size, strength, endurance, and, um, power. So I hope that that's clear for you too. There's heaps and stuff available to be able to explain that further. Um, definitely go through our amazing ATAR notes, e and unlimited guides and stuff like that to be able to make that even clearer for you or book in private tutoring. And we can talk about that more so. Um, there are a couple more questions, um, you know, in terms of being motivated, any tips and study schedules. I think set yourself up for goals. For now, up until the end of the HSC or your PE exam, at least once a week, 
you would need to have timed yourself 45 minutes and do some section of the PE exam. Whether it be multiple choice, short answers, whether it be the options, you would need to do that and really just try and stick to it. It's really hard, I know, and it is very individualized. Excuse me. But implementing all the tips that are in our lecture today, so going through past papers, group study syllabus, dot points, and trying to be able to memorize them, flashcards, planning, things like that, do really help. And I hope that you can feel a lot more at ease because they will show how much you've worked up until that point when you get to the HSC. I, um, so we've got a question here about physiological adaptations to training. And I absolutely love this dot point. Yes, of course, I can quickly explain it. So we've got a couple. Um, I had an acronym, but it related to my school. It was like an inside joke. So I'm not going to show you that acronym. But there are things like cardiac output, uh, stroke volume. Um, there's oxygen uptake. There is lung capacity. There's resting heart rate, hemoglobin levels. You've got your muscle hypertrophy. You've got your... Um, uh, things like that, then what we would go through really quickly. So for example, I like to think of stroke volume. When I think of volume, I think of capacity. I think of maths. I think of liters. When I think of that, it is the beat per, the beat, uh, sorry, the amount of blood that your heart beats per volume of blood, right? The amount, so the, the times that your heart beats per volume of blood, stroke volume, that comes hand in hand with cardiac output. Output has six letters. There is 60 seconds in one minute. So that is the amount of blood that happens, that goes out of your body per minute. They go hand in hand, obviously the higher exercise and anaerobic stuff, um, sorry, higher aerobic stuff that you do where you're working your um, cardiorespiratory system, those two will be enhanced and you'll be able to withstand longer periods of um, aerobic sport. Uh, then you've got things like muscle hypertrophy, which I went through. Resting heart rate gets lower and decreases the more you train. It just shows you that that's an indication of how fit your body is. Athletes generally have like a heart rate of maybe like 30, 40 and the average person has a resting heart rate of about 60, 70. So you can see a little bit of a difference. Um, your hemoglobin levels is what connects with, um, it's a red, it's a part of your red blood cell. It connects with oxygen and then delivers all of the oxygen to working muscles. So that increases because the more that you're working your muscles, the faster that they're able to continue moving and working, they're receiving all the nutrients that they require. Um, if you're looking at Things like lung capacity, it does not necessarily change because that is the size of your lungs. There are some different types of breathing that can impact the amount of lung space that is given to you. For example, um, I think there's like tidal capacity and residual capacity and stuff like that. So when you take in really deep breaths and exhale, the normal like breathing rate that you have when you're just doing normal things, um, stuff like that. You've got, um, I think there are others, I'm sure, stroke volume, cardiac output, resting heart rate, oxygen uptake. So that's just how much like oxygen you're consuming. Obviously, you want to ensure that your body is working not as hard for the um, sport that's happening because it's fit and it's able to withstand all of the demands of the game and things like that. Um, there, once again... Hit me up for private tutoring and we can go through this even more so in detail. Um, go through the ATAR notes guides on it unlimited um, online or in person. Use the discount codes there and be able to have that explained further. I want to ask you one more question um, before we wrap up for today. And this question is, how do you feel? <laughs> I am hoping to get a lot of excitement and you know, vibes and good energy about the HSD and after this lecture. I have loved being able to learn with you and do this with you and um, come alongside your journey of HSC throughout the year. It's fantastic. And I'm very, very excited and very proud of everything that you've done thus far. I would like to make a huge announcement to our sponsors and thank them again for our wonderful capacity and opportunity to do this today and to be here with you all. I am so excited all the responses are coming in. We've got some students to feel that feel really proud, feel excited. Um, they are really, really great. Some students said that this is um, a relief that it's recorded because sheesh, yeah, that's so fine. I completely understand. Um, but I hope that you definitely feel a lot better with yourself, with your content, 
with your actual exam capacity skills and the points of contact that you have in terms of your checklist of seeing the marks first, looking at the verb and then going through the content, going through, do you need an introductory sentence? Do you have an example? Do you understand and explain your verb? All of those things are really important. We got some great students that are like, HSC, here I come, fantastic. I'm so excited to be able to offer you this energy. I am hoping that you can really take on board everything that's been said. And just like you have been this whole day, absorb and absorb and absorb and I hope that you feel really really ready accomplished conquered and you know that you feel like you not conquered sorry I feel like that you can conquer the HSE um we are going to is my tutoring free <laughs> um feel free to just go through the website and have information sessions to book an info call um, it is not free but you'll be able to uh, find out all of that information the, like if you book in that info call and I would definitely love to meet you that'd be great and we will um, continue on this trajectory of awesomeness and readiness and success for our HSE good luck for your HSE take note of the time make sure that you practice under time conditions try and have a playlist that hypes you up to help with your anxiety and manage motivation and that's a pun as well and I will be seeing you shortly for your celebratory accomplishments of finishing the HSC. Thank you for your time, thank you for being here today, thank you for your engagement, thank you for your awesome brains and I will see you soon. Have a great holidays. <laughs> Bye everyone, thank you so much, you've been fantastic and I will see you soon. <laughs> Bye everyone.